Hi, everybody. This is Josh Becerra from Agurian. I have the pleasure of uh, interviewing Doug Spong for this episode of Augers on the Town. Doug is the founder and CEO of Doug Spong Company, which is an advisory firm to agencies. Uh, Doug has been in advertising world for over 35 years. Uh, the last 25 years, uh, he was a co-founder, president and manager of Carmichael Lynch, which works with iconic brands like Harley Davidson, Jack Lynx, and Subaru. So I'm super excited that we're having this opportunity to chat, Doug. Good to be here. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Well, um, I'm really curious, you know, you and I, we've had a couple of conversations, but I think some of the, the best parts of our conversations is when you talk a little bit about um, being the president and manager of Carmichael Lynch and what you learned working with brands. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, when you got into that role and the changes you had to kind of make in the agency to uh, see the growth that you saw when you were there. No, sure. Yeah. When, you know, I was there, as you said, for 25 years. So I saw a lot of change over those years. You know, the biggest change certainly would have been going from very uh, traditional television, print, outdoor, you know, environment uh, to uh, really an environment that uh, emphasized digital, frankly. Yeah. Um, you know, the spending, I could show you the, the revenue numbers, but the spending shifted uh, from one point where we were creating 55 to 60 print campaigns, not print ads, but campaigns, you know, with multiple print executions within each in the course of a year. Over time, that shifted to where we might have five or seven print campaigns, and it had all gone, you know, either into television or digital or, frankly, some kind of uh, amalgamation of the two, you know, where you're producing content that, you might have thought of it as originally for broadcast for television, but you might have a little longer form content for for online consumption, whether it's you know social or web, you know some of the proprietary channels uh, uh, that you might use. So that was certainly the biggest change was seeing you know kind of that shift in business. And yeah. so as an agency, we had to adapt to that. The people that we hired, the talent and skills that we were looking for, uh, became very different. And so we weren't looking for just great copywriters and print art directors anymore. We were, yep. you know, a lot of resources into funding uh, integrated production, things that uh, content across many different platforms that could be, you know, repurposed and re-edited and reused to really create one kind of seamless uh, campaign for a client. Yeah. And I know that, um, you know, a lot of companies sought out Carmichael Lynch when they were thinking about like, or their brand was kind of getting stale or they just, they needed something new. Can you talk a little bit about like how you would, uh, you were approaching those projects? Cause I yeah. think it was interesting in our previous conversation. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I think yeah, there's, there's two kinds of typically two kinds of brands or clients that you represent. You know, there are those that um, ha might have, be struggling with a low brand awareness, not really have a following, relatively low revenue in terms of sales, that's looking to, you know, to grow, to be able to, they're a distant second, third, fifth in the category, and they're looking to grab the category leader by the ankles and pull them off, you know, pull them off that king of the hill position. Sure. And those are fun brands, you know, those are, we can call them challenger brands in the industry. Uh, and then you've got other brands. Uh, we worked with Harley Davidson, you know, mature brands that have been around, you know, in this case, for 125 years with Harley that, uh, you know, they have been, you know, category leaders in, in their space. They had a lot of upcoming challengers. Uh, uh, I mean, the story of that is when they first came to us, uh, you know, we had never heard of what Jack Link's brand was, which, of course, nowadays seems hard yeah. to believe uh, because it is fairly ubiquitous in the snack category. But uh, here it was, you know, we love to talk about, brand marketers love to talk about David versus Goliath. And, and the reality is there are very few true David and Goliath stories. It's usually David taking on a David, you know, small brands yeah. kind of fighting it out with each other. 
or you've got a Goliath taking on another Goliath. But in this case, it really was a true kind of David and Goliath story. Here you had Jack Links, which was yeah, individually and personally owned by Jack Link himself. Yes, there really is a Jack Link. Yeah. And uh, his son, Troy, who's the CEO. And the Goliath in that category was ConAgra Foods, you know, this giant global sure. company that owned the Slim Jim brand. And of and, course, Slim Jim. And a hundred other brands, right? Yeah. And a hundred other brands, absolutely. And Slim Jim had this dominant number one category position in the, in the meat snack business. And Jack Links, when they first came to us, had low to no brand awareness. Um, I even went to our typical hook and bullet crowd upstairs in the creative department to say, have you guys ever heard of Jack Links? And, you know, these are guys who love to fish and hunt and, yeah, you know, yeah. where you think of typical jerky consumption and they go, ah, Jack Links, Jack Links, no. Yeah. Well, it turns out the packaging design at that time was so bad that when you tore open the package, you literally ripped the brand name right off of it. So all <laughs> you were stuck with was the packaging that said jerky on yeah. it. Uh, you know, which was also part of the problem. So, you know, the first thing that we did was we said, hey, this is a fun brand to compete with. Uh, we agreed to take it on. And so we wanted to compete for this piece of business. And, you know, we, we here we looked at Slim Jim found kind of a complacent category leader that really hadn't innovated much. The, the product quality was just, eh, you know, so, yeah, so. I would agree with that. And, we, you know, we love this kind of Jack Link's never say die type of attitude that they had. So, you know, our approach um, has always been speak to the core and others will listen in. Um, mm -hmm. And so in everything that we do, whether it's for Jack Link, Subaru, Harley, other brands, you know, it's this idea that you have to really identify, understand, and uh, have empathy for and relate to that core that core is and in the case of Jack Links what we discovered through our insights work is that um, we ended up branding them as adventurous spirits that was you know kind of the term that we called I, I love to call them mindless munching males you know they're kind of a young 26 year old guy oh yeah use uh, use male but there are women who have a very shared mindset with these guys so it isn't just all male but these adventurous spirits you know they're not your typical grocery retail consumer yeah, or they, they, store they, don't, kind of they don't sit and come up with their grocery list or put it on their phone and go in and spend two hundred dollars shopping at Cub Foods or something. You know, when these when these young guys, mindless munching males, when they shop, they basically go to the convenience store. They pull off, go to the C store, yes, walk in, grab their can of Mountain Dew, Diet Mountain Dew, and grab something off the end cap kind of satisfy that that hunger pain that they have at the time. Yep, yep. And I've seen, them. I've seen yeah, them in the wild. Absolutely. The other thing is adventure spirits are not typical media consumers. So they were, of all of the kind of segments that you go after, that young male is probably the hardest to reach from a media consumption standpoint. You know, they don't wake up and watch the Today Show. They don't subscribe to a daily newspaper. Right. These, these are... This is a consumer who really, you know, if they do watch television, it's Comedy Central, it's MTV, uh, it's late night television. Uh, if they're online, they're not necessarily huge social networkers. What right. they're online doing is they love the game. You know, they're online gaming late at night uh, with people that are complete strangers to them, but they feel like they know because they're, you know, gaming Dungeons and Dragons or something else online. Sure. Uh, so it's a very typical uh, a very atypical kind of media consumer. Um, the other thing is when you look at the product of like a Jack Links, it's very much an impulse purchase. It's not, uh, it's not a considered purchase. You know, yeah. it's an impulse. So this idea of being kind of top of mind in a fun, playful way with these guys um, and being located at that end cap at C store, you know, was crucial to us. So, what we ended up with was uh, a brand position that was all around uh, Feed Your Wild Side. And so you still, if you go to jacklinks.com or you see the television today, it still has that same brand position that we developed from the very start with this brand. Right. And so it's this idea of, you know, kind of a fun playfulness. Uh, as you look at the execution of Jack Links, there's always a, a huge dose of humor. Mm -hmm. with it. And the reason for that is, as a lot of marketers either know or have discovered over the years, is humor is 
it's the number one kind of emotional connector that you can have between you know brands and their bullseye target and yeah. so that brand uses a lot of humor so we ended up executing that brand position of feed your wild side with a campaign called messing with sasquatch and messing with sasquatch you know became uh, the honest thing is, you know, people like to say, oh, my gosh, your consumer insights led you to this idea of using Sasquatch. And what I honestly say is, no, that's I, I'd love in a perfect world to say that's how it worked. Sure. But it was really kind of this uh, intersection, frankly, of how uh, we had a creative director, Brock Davis, who probably for three or four different client campaigns had been trying to find a way to use Sasquatch. He was just enamored with Sasquatch. Pitching, about, pitching Sasquatch. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you think about Sasquatch, you know, he's ubiquitous because uh, we might call him Sasquatch in the Midwest. If you go to the Pacific Northwest, he's a Bigfoot. Right. If you're in Asia, he's a Yeti. So everybody kind of knows what Sasquatch is and has this kind of affinity for, for Sasquatch. You know, he's kind of a scary character, but at the same time, we're also intrigued by, you know, is he real? Is he not? What would he be like if I actually ran across him in the wild? Um, and so what we did was we, we executed um, this uh, messing with Sasquatch campaign, frankly, through um, so many different media, you know, that became kind of the messing with Sasquatch was that central spine, of an idea that we built everything off of that. Sure. And so the way it was executed is, you know, you saw uh, the 30 second television uh, where, you know, people were so used to that voiceover opening the spot that said, Jack Link's Beef Jerky presents Messing with Sasquatch. And it had kind of the same little plot to each of the 30 second spots. You know, it would be our adventurous spirits who index very high for outdoors. They love to canoe, kayak, bike, hike, We'd find them out in the outdoors, socializing with others uh, of a similar age and, and demo. And they would stumble across this mythical character, Sasquatch. They would come up with one of them would take a bite of jerky, come up with this wild haired idea of how do I mess with them? Um, and so they would actually execute that. They would, they would mess with them. And then at the end of the spot, of every spot, Sasquatch always got his revenge in some way. Yeah. And so that was kind of the, the typical plot for a messing with Sasquatch spot. We also had, if you went online, it was kind of a too hot for TV version on YouTube. Um, and so we would run these spots that we knew the censors at NBC weren't going to accept. Right. Um, we could go on and they had that, again, kind of that mindless munching male kind of sense of humor, kind of sometimes a little bit on the gross side, a little bit, you know, maybe some vulgar yeah, related yeah. to it. Um, and so it was a lot of fun. We also developed uh, a lot of consumer generated content where you know you're doing your job as a brand marketer when consumers take your brand and start making their own messing with Sasquatch commercials. So they would dress, yeah. dress up their girlfriends in this gorilla suit. They'd take them out to the wild. They'd have a little you know, kind of storyline developed and they would film these 30 second spots and they'd do this voiceover of Jack Link's Beef Jerky Presents Messing with Sasquatch. And we ended up with literally, uh, there were about a thousand consumer generated spots yeah. that went on the, the YouTube channel, That's generating in, in excess of 25 million views on YouTube just from people generating this themselves. Um, we also did a lot knowing that our consumer was a heavy online and gaming consumer. So we had a, a messing with Sasquatch game where you could uh, you could actually go online and you could mess with Sasquatch himself. You could uh, you know swing a piece of log and hit a critter, things like that that yeah. you would expect Sasquatch to do. And then we developed even a living Sasquatch app where people could take their laptop or cell phone camera. And through this app, you could actually download a little um, GIF of Sasquatch and you could animate it and then you could record it. Then you could post it to your social channels. You could share it on your social channels. Yeah. And it was all a way to help you kind of generate that. And then of course, you know, you get into sports partnerships, you get into experiential um, and even media, you know, we had uh, brands like, uh, you know, entertainment brand Rascal Flatts. So the artists, uh, would be in People Magazine saying one thing they go on the road with, 
uh, that they couldn't do without is their Jack Link's beef jerky. Yeah. Uh, so yeah it no, just, that's awesome. It, the whole thing kind of snowballed that way. And so, you know, the end result was, to kind of make a long story short, the end result was here you had a brand that was a distant third in the category that leapfrog number two and leapfrog number one to become the number one, not only the number one meat snack and jerky brand in the category, supplanting Slim Jim, but frankly, they supplanted every brand, every food brand in convenience store, in C wow. store. So they became the number one by volume, by revenue volume, seller in all of C store. And they're and, still headquartered in Wisconsin, right? Well, they're, they're from Minong, Wisconsin. Yeah, that's where the Link Boys are from. And if you, yeah. if you drive through kind of you know, that part of Wisconsin, you go by the Link Motors. So they have the, one of the oldest Ford dealerships in the country. They own the grocery store, the Avenue dealership. Sure. Uh, but they actually have kind of technically moved their Jack Link's headquarters to downtown Minneapolis in what's now the uh, Mayo Clinic uh, building. Got it. Cool. And where Timberwolves practice. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's amazing how from like just thinking about that uh mindless munching male as you've called characterize the the persona to to be able to develop all of those things around the brand and like really align like where is that persona live online uh in the real world how can we be uh top of mind because that's all you need to be when they look at that end cap and, and whatever they need there to satisfy their hunger. So I love that story. I think it's amazing. Uh, it's a, a brand um, like no other in many ways. What do you think about um, brands today? Like, have you, have you seen any brands that you think have come on the scene or, that are doing a great job either given the context that we're living right now or just in general? Do you have any brands that you think are lining up all the stars the way you did with Jack Links? Yeah, you know, I, I do. I, I see a lot of brands that are really, um, I think, fairly quick to adapt to the reality, you know, that we're all living with right now. And, yep. and uh, you know, I think part of it is there's kind of a consumer activism that's that's going on, you know, where, one of the things that's changed the most, I would say, in the last uh, 10 years has been consumers' expectations of their favorite brands, which is that they not only provide you know, this great relationship with the consumer themselves, but the brands also, in a sense, kind of fill the void that government and a lot of our elected officials haven't been able to fill to this point. And then, so when you look at just recently, you know, with Black Lives Matter, uh, racial equity, you look at the Me Too movement, you look at uh, climate change, uh, there are a lot of things that, that brands are being asked to kind of fill in, you know, those gaps that yeah. uh, our elected officials just aren't addressing right now. So, you know, one of the things that I think a uh, great brand here locally in the Twin Cities that is making all the right moves is Target. You know, yeah. you look at the fact that they were, and they didn't have to be, but Brian Cornell, the CEO, and in their team, made the choice to say, you know what, we are going to pay a livable wage to all of our part-time and full-time workers um, at the stores, their associates. And so what they did was they elevated to $15 an hour and they set a date and said, by this date, we're going to pay every worker $15 an hour. Yep. Um, and, you know, that's to address that kind of wage inequity that is, you know, you hear about the, the it's not even middle class. I mean, most of us understand 15 an hour is even achieving middle class, but it does, you know, it's enough of a livable wage uh, for people that it, it, it helps fulfill and helps fill in kind of that, that pothole that's been sitting there. Yeah. Uh, you also look at how, you know, Target, when it comes to like restrooms, and they've come up with kind of gender neutral identification on restrooms. So really reaching out to the LGBTQ community and saying, you know, no, no matter how you identify in terms of your, uh, your gender, um, you know, Target makes a very friendly environment in store for that. Yep. And those are yep. huge. And, and, you know, Target, of course, is, is as you would expect, has, has taken some criticism from 
conservative side of, of, of that argument. Uh, but, the, you know, they, they, they're not afraid to plant their flag on issues like wages and issues on gender identification uh, because it's the right thing to do, not just as a business, but also for their guests. And that, that's Target, I think, really, like Jack Links and other great brand marketers, really understands intimately who their guest, who their consumer is. And as I yeah. said, you know, they, they know to speak to that core and that others will listen in on that piece of it. One other well, brand. The fact, just, the fact that they're doing it without it needing to be legislated, right? Uh, that it's not at all. Yeah, no, there's no a decision on their part. And, and actually they're leading. Then it gets their competition to kind of look at them and say, man, we have to, we have to have a point of view on this. Um, so I, it is, it's super valuable to have brands, uh, and large businesses where a tremendous amount of kind of the population interacts with that business, um, right. kind of planting those flags. Right. And even, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of, I think, big surprises in brand marketing too, where you think about a brand like Walmart that historically, you know, being a, a Southern based company having kind of grown up, you know, serving a much more conservative uh, rural versus urban base of consumers. I mean, here you've got Walmart that has removed um, all AR-15 gun sales. They've removed uh, ammunition. Yep. Uh, so they are no longer selling guns and ammo. You've got Walmart that has, um, you know, come out against the Confederate flag. Again, a current issue that yep. they will not sell any merchandise that has the Confederate flag in it. Um, and even, you know, recently, just this week, you know, Walmart said, we are not going to sell anything related to the Washington Redskins fan apparel. So, give, yeah. you know, the, that image of the chief and the name Redskins, uh, until that changes, Washington will not have apparel represented at Walmart, among other retailers. But that's a you know, that's a very big shift, I think, for a retailer that most of us, particularly here in the in the bold north, you know, tend to think of as as kind of, you know, southern, rural. Sure. You know, they cater to a, you know, gun loving crowd. And, and right. you know, it's, it's very different for them. And, yeah. and so you, you got to applaud brands like Walmart that are willing to do that and put a flag, you know, plant a flag in the ground. On it. Yeah. No, I think I think that's. It's amazing. It's amazing times we're living in um, and change is happening really quickly. And I think brands, even big brands, which traditionally probably uh, aren't perceived as nimble, are actually like being pretty nimble and facing some tough choices and, and making them um, probably quicker than they want to. But uh, but yeah, that's the world in which we live. So. Let's talk a little bit about the, especially like, I know you've, because you were a leader of a, a agency for so long and because of your consulting work with agencies, um, where do you see kind of the future of agencies going um, given this context and just what, what you think about the future of agencies? I'm just curious. Well, I, I can tell you one thing that, you know, from the day, I started in this business back in 1981. I've heard about the death of agencies <laughs> from so many pundits out there that yep. it's, it's laughable. So first of all, um, you're never going to hear me say that I think our business is, you know, is at risk. It's not. Um, you know, you and I make a living in the creative economy. Yeah. The creative economy is a very different professional services environment from accounting, legal, management, consulting, and others. And it's interesting to watch, you know, like the big four accounting firms. So you look at Deloitte, um, uh, Ernst, KPMG, yeah, yep, and and how they've gotten into trying to leverage their strategy side with acquiring creative agencies. And so you you know you've seen Droga Five acquired, for instance, you know by one of the one of the the big four. Um, and so I'll be interested to see how that works. But I I, I think what that tells you is. If, if you see the big four management consulting companies, you know, trying to get into our business, it tells you that there's a, a huge value proposition that they can't easily build themselves. 
Yep. And the same goes for clients who want to build it in in house. You know, most clients simply cannot attract the level of creative talent and frankly the broad holistic thinking to be able to take you know this thousand piece puzzle of what we do every day in terms of brand marketing and try to put the, the thousand pieces of that puzzle together to have it make sense for a brand and have it really each piece of the puzzle work together to create a, a complete picture for a consumer right but that's the unique skill set that I think the best agencies and the agencies going forward that are going to uh, thrive are really great at putting those pieces together. And part of that is, you know, our business is, it's a little kind of half art, half science. You know, we've got the true art side of what we do, you know, from the art direction and design and the illustration and animation, and you've got sure. the, you know, the production side of the business. And then you've got the, the research and the insights and the data analytics and you know the measurement and you know optimizing real time science part of the business that we do and the best yep. agencies not only staff both but more importantly they each side i think has developed an inherent um, appreciation for the other side so in other words you know not only does the analytics and the science side of the business support the art side of the business. But great agencies also understand that the art side, you know, the creative side of the business has a real impact on and yeah. partner with the analytics side. And that's, you know, that's a change. It always used to be one way. Analytics drives insight and creative, but now it goes as much the other way too. And so I think a lot of the future is going to be around that. The other thing is, you know, because we all were either working from home or we're limited to how much time and how much density we're packing into office space right now. I think the best agencies are focused on um, their staff, you know, very much focused on uh, not just, you know, it goes beyond work life balance. It's really, it's kind of right now, it's a, you know, it's, it's kind of a personal well being that I yeah. think CEOs are very, uh, careful and invest a lot of time in worrying about their people's well-being, uh, you know, their mental health, their physical health, um, kind of their career satisfaction that they're having with what they're doing right now. And so what I find is that, you know, having as an agency, having a crystal clear understanding of who you are as a brand and what value do you bring to the world, not just to your clients, but to the broader world. Because when you think about it, you know, we, we exist for our staff. You yeah. know, I say they're number one, take care of staff, number one. We exist for our clients, because if you don't take care of staff, they're not going to take care of clients. Yep. A third thing is, you know, the work, the magic that those two things create, the staff put together with our clients, creates this, you know, Steve Jobs used to call it putting a dent in the world, uh, or putting a dent in the universe. Yeah. You know, and that's why you went to work at Apple. And I think it's a lot of that is very true in our business where um, people who love and are, have the highest level of satisfaction in our industry really feel like they're making a dent in the world in some way. They're, they're putting their mark on it. They're making it a little bit better place to be. Yeah. And so that's, that's a big focus, I think, for agencies is to kind of, you know, take care of that staff first. The other thing I can tell you is, um absolutely positively there is a correlation between uh employee satisfaction in agencies and financial performance yeah. the two go hand in hand if you look at if you want to reverse engineer how do the best agencies that are generating the highest levels of operating income uh, and net income at the end of the year what are they doing that's different from all the other agencies that are struggling to make an operating profit, struggling to grow, struggling yeah. to make money. It goes back to their staff satisfaction. And so that's a, that's a huge part of it. It impacts um, productivity. It impacts absenteeism. It impacts uh, attrition and mm -hmm. turnover. It impacts ability to hire the very best people. And it impacts the quality of the work that come out of those people. So the higher the employee and staff satisfaction, the better the financial performance of those agencies. It just goes hand in hand.
Yeah. Yeah. I would, I'd totally agree with you. Um, you know, we focus a lot at Agurian on our values as a company and our brand, but more importantly on our people. Um, and we think that that is the big difference. We talk about it a lot. Uh, we invest a lot in them. We try to create that environment where they can um, come to work and be their true selves every single day and um, have that mental health and the, um, the time away from work also to to uh, recharge the batteries. So um, I want to yeah. show you one thing too, just as kind of a punctuation. I just <laughs> happened to yeah, yeah. I have sitting on my, my uh, desk here. It's a little urn. And if you can't read it, it says ashes. Hold it up a little higher. So this Hold actually this was given to me by my uh, longtime partner, Lee Lynch, years ago. And, you know, as a, uh, I've only got two clients that I've burned the contract in here of, um, and it, it, it emphasizes the fact that you, you know, if you've got a client that distracts or dilutes um, your culture and your character as, as an agency, you know, my, my first thing I so I ask clients is, you know, how would you be better off without that client? You, 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 you know, don't be afraid yep. to terminate a bad client. Right. You know, uh, uh, you know, we've always said we don't work with assholes. It was always kind of rule number one is don't work with assholes. And so there, you know, people would be amazed at the number of clients that we parted with over the years that just, you know, they were a drag on the morale of the staff and yeah. they didn't afford great work. They didn't appreciate great work. And they were contrary to everything that we were about as an agency. And so I think it's, it's very important for, agencies to select the clients that identically match and perfectly next to perfectly fit who yeah. they are as an agency. Yeah, that's uh, great. I can't stress that enough too. Yeah, that's great advice. I uh, I find myself whenever we have a conversation, I just sit and listen and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically been our entire interview today, Doug. Um, I. <laughs> so appreciate all of our conversation always uh you are a fountain of wisdom and um and i really appreciate you taking the time today to do this it's been Thanks, fun for me. and i hope that uh, you. thank you i hope that people listening also uh take advantage of your wisdom <laughs>